everybody. Mondo, New York, home to outcast, misfit, reject, pervert lunatics. Mondo, New York, gangsters, pranksters, and outlaws. So we're here today talking to why don't you introduce yourself yourself sir and tell us who you are and what you do <laughs> okay uh my name is Stuart shapiro um i'm a filmmaker a media streaming uh curator and creator um i um started out in uh, 1976 with international harmony my first um independent film distribution company uh which was uh well known for cult hits like rust never sleeps and the day the music died and reggae sun splash and blank generation and doa um to say all the good stuff all good stuff so i've been a counter culture uh, beacon is what I try to actually call myself um, more than a producer. Beacon, you know, meaning I kind of been a curator, curator, curatorial producer. Mm-hmm. I also had a 20 year stint where I left the entertainment business and went to work in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Congress on uh, creative applications for constituent communication with elected officials which was a complete turnaround for a right. punk new york mondo guy going through the halls of congress but i did do it i uh, wore a tie and jacket and a white shirt for a long time and then finally um i had the chance to get my rights back to mondo new york after a very long route um and then actually had to wait till I stopped working for the government um, uh, be, to be able to release Mondo New York, which uh, sort of um, was um, edgy enough to be problematic with uh, my reputation had it been seen by the right or wrong sources. And here I am. Everyone's an asshole. Everyone's a creep. I look out my Mondo, New York. Mondo, New York um, is what we're here to talk about. I, I have to say that, you know, this is a movie that I never expected to be seeing on Blu-ray. <laughs> well, good. I mean, it's, it's, you meant, you kind of hinted at it being problematic. I mean, I, I always thought maybe now it's more problematic than it was in, in the 80s. I th- there's no question about that. Yeah, there, there, everything is actually more problematic. You know, I tell everybody um, back in the uh, 70s and or into the early 80s when I was a film distributor before I started Night Flight in 1981, you could go to the movie theaters at midnight, smoke pot, and drink, and get fucked up in the movie theaters and nobody cared. You can't. You know, you could have trouble smoking vape vape in a movie theater today, and 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 maybe get busted. But um, yeah, they're going to call you if your phone goes off. Yeah, um, the uh, Mondo New York um, is uh, still rough, um, which I'm proud of in one hand, and still scares still scares me in another hand. But I'm proud that it's the time jewel that it really is. Mm. I mean, it's it's been so long since I'd previously seen the film because, you know, I read about it in, what, about 80, 87, I guess. And then it took me a long time to find a copy, which was just a kind of multi-generation down VHS bootleg at that point. So I guess, you know, you're not appreciating yeah. it. But that was the only one you would see over here. And I think 
in the UK, you probably still have real problems with this. Certainly, you'd have to remove Joe Coleman. You know? Yeah, yeah, I know. So, you know, it's really into Joe Coleman's a funny story because, you know, um, I don't know if you got a chance to see the interview. So Joe Coleman is really kind of like the essence of what is Mondo and art, the art world or art mm. performance. And, you know, everybody said, well, why don't you just cut out Joe Coleman's segment and then you wouldn't have that problem. And, you know, my uh, response to that was, well, I'm a filmmaker. I made that film. I would never cut it out come higher hell water because that's the integrity of my art um so i really had to wait till i could face a more punk universe <laughs> without retribution <laughs> yeah i mean it's i mean it's it's pure mondo in terms of if we look at the mondo movies of the the 60s and 70s it's it's everything that those films were controversial for in the first place isn't it yeah, I mean, the difference, though, is those films, for the most part, were fake and set up. Yeah. Um, which was why my homage within Mondo, New York, was to do the the um, the uh, uh, slave scene, which was completely fake. So mm -hmm. I felt that I had to slice something into the movie that was totally fake for the sake of uh, homage more than anything. And Sometimes it pissed people off, I guess, you know, why was it in there? But, you know, when people ask me, I think, you know, well, it's like most of the Mondo films were completely fake and set up. And why not put one of those into the sense of real? Everything else, of course, was real. Joe was real. Um, I mean, what was the what was the inspiration for using the Mondo title? Because, you know, the film, you know, on the one hand, it, it definitely seems to fit into into that world but on the other hand it's it's clearly not you know it's not mondo carne it's not savage yeah. beast well i mean is it is an independent filmmaker um you got to start with a good title you know i mean you're you're going mm -hmm. into in those days you were pitching a uh, home video division to finance a documentary film like that, you know, so you had to try to find 150 grand, which was readily available in those days for um, video. So, you know, what do you do? You go in and pitch a story, you know, like, ah, I'm going to do a performance art scene and a bunch of people running around. No, you go, hey, I got Mondo, New York, and all of a sudden you got a ring. So, you know, as an independent um, I mean, we used to laugh about it way back in the, in the really old days. The guys actually started with a poster before they shot a fucking movie. Yeah. I mean, the old school in, indie producers and distributors, they would start with a title or they would rip off a title that was, uh, you know, a make off of something else, throw in a one sheet, try to sell the movie. They would go to the markets with a one sheet. People go, hey, I like that. They got a pre-sale. Pre-sale gives you the amount of money to be able to go make your movies. That's how the movies were made in those days. So, you know, Mondo, I was always a Mondo fan to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I distributed Faces of Death at midnight. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was pretty easy for me to conceive. But, you know, also, I mean, the true story of how I came up with the epiphany of Mondo, which I have said over and over again, um, I had left Night Flight after uh, many years of producing a day and night for nonstop. And it got somewhat uh, censored, but I had a kid and, and I had to really try to escape the drug rock and roll world of New York in the mid 80s because I was too much a part of it. I mm -hmm. went to Brazil to get away I, with my three month old kid and I was on the beach of Ipanema and somebody came up to me and said, is it true that there are alligators in um, the sewers of New York City and maybe even in the subways? And I went, holy bingo. <laughs> oh, went, wow, that's a good idea. Maybe I should go back to New York and do Mondo New York. And, you know, one thing led to another. And OK, I had a friend that was uh, Seth Willinson, who he was head of home video at Paramount. And I went to Seth and, and he's an old film guy. And, uh, you know, all the old film guys knew Mondo. It was always sort of out there on the side. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know how many people ever, you know, watched Mondo Carney, but, you know, in, in the, I would say in the sixties, it was kind of outrageous and mm. represented a certain area that, you know, was taboo, not sexual, but taboo, crazy shit. And, and Seth loved the idea. So he actually financed the, he gave me the production money. What happened was when I finished the film and I brought it to Paramount Home Video, it was the same time that Eddie Murphy's Raw was being produced. And um, we d gave, sent it to the uh, uh, rating, the MPA rating. And they basically said, you, you better start all over again. If you think you're ever going to get an R rating on this film, there's nothing to cut start all over again and paramount you know they didn't want to go try to fight some dumbass mondo movie with eddie murphy's raw which was a, you know really a major deal for them and also eddie murphy was major league um they gave me the movie back they said hey we can't distribute this film you can have right. it back you know, it was re in, re in return that was pretty cool um and um thankfully chris blackwell who was uh, always a ballsy distributor and producer and everything, fell in love with the movie, and he put it out. So, I mean, what what was the reaction to it at the time? Because I think it was pretty strong. I mean, it played at midnights. We had, I remember jo Joey Arias, he told me that he remembers going, like, regularly to the screenings at, not, at midnight and singing and performing and it was somewhat of a the audience um i mean i only seen it a few times recently uh but the audience always went fucking crazy and wild to the film it was a very it was kind of a, somewhat of an interactive experience um and then um that was it you know and it kind of died and went on its way and it was released on vhs by the sundance channel um for a short period of time and then that was it and then um i was lucky because i had a 20-year license agreement with um with chris's company fourth and broadway and that was sold to polygram and that was sold to the film transferred like a million places and finally ended up in the mgm uh library somehow and after 20 years, my rights were back. It took several years for me to get the negative out. But then I always wanted to do a, you know, a 4K, 2K, 4K transfer because, you know, it's um, it's so much more beautiful. And then I redid the sound on it. So it was like, you know, it's sort of, to me, uh, you know, most people know me as Night Flight, um, which is mm. sort of my core um, persona in a sense. But when I think about my, uh, my career of content that I've been associated with, I think that Mondo New York will stand the test of time more than anything. I think in a hundred years time, you'll look at Mondo New York and it'll give you a, a view of a time that doesn't exist anymore, places that don't exist anymore. And frankly, I don't think there's a lot of films that, that um, can stand up to that um, sequence of time. Capture. Yeah, because that's what I was thinking. It's 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 that time capsule of of that era, and I guess some of the people in in that were were quite big. I mean, obviously Lydia, I guess, was still, was already you know a big name on the um, on the alternative scene, right. the transgressive scene, whatever. But you know, you've got people who were essentially not too well known at the time became bigger names later on. Did you, did you feel that you were kind of discovering stuff, or were you just going along with the with the flow oh you no know, I, part I, of, I, part of I've, scene, so. I've always been a dis, uh, a promoter of discovery of talent uh i mean um i mean you could say for the most part i mean joey clearly um his reputation mm. was really garnished by mondo dean and the weenies and that particular song of fuck you became very popular but also, I've been told anecdotally that uh, a lot of artists after Mondo came out actually were influenced to come to New York if they were alternative and cutting edge performance artists that that Mondo um, 
gave them encouragement and incentive to move to New York City. And, you know, a lot of people say it's influenced a variety of, of uh, counterculture performance artists, but I, I really don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to, you know. I, I mean, um, I think the, the, the great idea of the film as well is that having that character who is like the audience, I guess, on screen, who takes you from place to place, you know, the girl who's just wandering around. I mean, was that was that the idea that she stands in for the audience discovering all this artwork? Yeah, yes, yes. But also Harvey Keith, who was the director, he was a he was a aficionado of uh, foreign French and Italian films. And mm -hmm. uh, he was particularly influenced by the Red Balloon. Um, uh -huh. and he thought the metaphor was that she was like the red that's why she wore the red sneakers and he saw this as like the little red blue going around but i mean i um i'm not a fan of hosts or personalities that sort of intro um mm. I've, all of my films have tried to avoid that for the most part and i also have been pretty much involved in um segments making up my films uh comedy dirtiest dozen was a uh, 12 30 comedians uh um even tunnel vision my first film in 1976 was a series of vignette films over and over yeah. again no host no nothing um so i kind of believe in that format night flight never had a host only a voiceover i felt i always felt that hosts get in the way so it yeah. wasn't like we were going to walk around with a personality and, hey, now we're going to go see the CBG club and watch some punks go fucking crazy. So she was, and that was Harvey's idea, um, young. The innocence was the most important component to her. Right. And he had that. And that was the juxtaposition of the innocent young girl and the madness of the other side. So you, you obviously you've mentioned Night Flight a couple of times. I think a lot of people over here maybe not so familiar with that. Can you tell us a little bit about what that so, was? All right. So Night Flight was uh, I had my um, my film distribution company, International Harmony, for for five years or six years, distributing uh, mostly music films and some horror films, but it was really the counterculture uh, indie distribution company. And then in 1981, when cable started to take off, I had the idea of, of going to what then was, uh, hadn't just started to be USA Network. They were not playing late night content. Generally, um, you know, in the old days, uh, television stations would actually go off the air, you know, at 12 or one o'clock. And the same thing was sort of happening with cable. And I was doing literally a hundred shows uh, a weekend, Friday and Saturday night of uh, 11, 12 o'clock uh, sold out shows. So I had this sort of sense that there was this huge audience and I knew that it existed. So I went and I pitched USA Network on a late night program. It was before MTV started, but uh, um, I had the kind of uh, content and I knew I had the ability to to acquire feature films, and uh, I just knew that that there was a undeserved um, audience that wanted to come home late at night or come from the clubs, turn on TV, and watch something. And I also knew that there was just a endless amount of content that wasn't actually getting anywhere. You could get it on VHS, but there, the the idea of cable and late night programming on cable didn't exist. So I was very lucky. I pitched USA Network with a partner, Jeff Franklin, and uh, they went for it. And um, long story short, Night Flight became the all night long uh, slot Friday night and Saturday night on USA for eight years. Mm. Uh, and I created that show and I produced it and I directed a very large, uh, over 300 long form interviews with just about all the major artists in the 80s and then we would take their music videos and cut profiles so that whole library of uh, air masters uh, seven thousand hours and hundreds of profiles and hundreds of interviews of artists that actually talked really freely back then so that was sort of stuck in uh, a warehouse 
um, until the 2000s, um, I had a chance to uh, reacquire all the rights through a, just a crazy act of serendipity. And I had to wait till um, it was, uh, as an independent, capable to start a streaming channel. So, and not only part of starting a streaming channel as an independent, not having to spend millions of dollars to build the technology, which up until maybe, you know, 2015 or so, you would have to really build stuff. There was not companies that started building independent streaming capacity, but also the ability to, to convert uh, digitally one inch tapes, which most of my library is in one inch tapes to yeah. uh, digital was prohibitive uh, cost wise and time wise until that sort of all came to bear. So, um, you know, I sort of parked all this for many years and then it was always my dream to have an uncensored network. I mean, Tunnel Vision in 1976 was the story of the first uncensored network. Yeah. As a precursor, somehow, you know, my life has been kind of um, mirrored and, and repeated through a lot of the content that I've actually made. And sometimes, it, you know, you tell the story through uh, what may happen to you in the future. Um, so Night Flight was um, really successful, uh, ran for eight years um and had a really devoted audience people for the most part uh it was a, a beacon of alternative entertainment it was new wave it was punk it was a fantastic animation festival it was you know just everything on the edge and it presented to people i have if you lived in new york or maybe if you lived in la you were exposed to that in clubs and but if you were in the rest of the world, it was the world was flat. Yeah. So if you were growing up in the middle of America and you were the only punk in town, and Night Flight came out with New Wave Theater, and you know the Dead Kennedys and you know the massive punk New Wave bands that came out, it was like you realized that um, you weren't the only person on earth, and it gave a lot of uh, strength and salvation to uh, millions of young folks who were basically on the on the edge of life and didn't you know and realize there were a lot of people like them late night audience concerts and cult classics never before seen on tv features such as neil young's rust never sleeps Jimi hendrix in jimmy plays berkeley bob marley in reggae sun splash the london rock and roll show with timeless performances by chuck berry jerry lee lewis and little richard rare footage from jim morrison and the doors the grateful dead live at radio city Plus comedy cult classics never before seen on television, like the outrageous Tunnel Vision, the bizarre J-Men Forever, and the controversial Lenny Bruce films. In the past three years, Night Flight has kept pace with the video music revolution in its own unique style. Night Flight's Takeoff is a thematic look at current trends and the latest developments in music video. It brings a new dimension to watching and listening to video music. Takeoff looks at the controversy surrounding sex and violence in music videos. It examines the use of comedy and animation in music videos and focuses on varied musical styles from reggae to heavy metal. So I started Night Flight Plus um, seven or so years ago. It's a it's a, some people call it a punk criterion network. I don't know if you guys have criterion over there. Yeah, um, kind of great. So it's like a punk. It's very punk. It's got all the original episodes, but then it has thousands of uh, of licensed content. Um, we release new films every single week. We have quite a strong subscriber base growing, and it's pretty organic. It's pretty punk, and uh, there's really a collection of oddities like no, nowhere anywhere, and and striving quite quite well. So that's that's my my day job and my uh, reason for trying to stay young at 75 still. Well, that's, that's great. And I think that it's interesting that you're kind of almost reversing what a lot of people worry about with, uh, with digital and with streaming that, you know, that we lose things because it's all, it all becomes ephemeral again. Whereas you're taking something that was, I guess was seen as ephemeral at the time that you know you were doing it 
uh, you know, for a cable network. So therefore, it, after the week it was on, it was it was gone until until whenever. And now you're just archiving it for for kind of permanence, aren't you? Yeah, and and also, I mean, I I I call the night flight library. I use the library because part of the um, what what I do attempt to do there's a, a lot of uh, uh, local access shows. So mm -hmm. basically, I'm, I I look at night flight as somewhat as a curating a library as well to um, put up um shows that you know maybe local in la or local in new york i have a show that's in atlanta now and they're public access shows so they're you know they're really on the edge but also we have some really old public access shows um that really prop you know maybe you could find them on youtube but it's you know it's important so i i, I have the 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 philosophy and the strategy to cure to basically make night flight a repository of, of stuff that you are hard to find and hard to get. Um, I have one friend that's um, been going through uh, an old video store library and he's making a huge stack of kind of really hard to find VHS that don't seem to have a license issue or maybe public domain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's called, you know, he's calling me up and go, Hey, I got all this stack. Let's, Let's transfer this stack of your stuff. So night flights like that, but also um, what's happening in the streaming business, as you probably well know, a night flight and Mondo New York is a perfect example. You have companies like Severin uh, that are doing 4K original transfers of um, feature films from yeah. the greats in uh, Italy, and you know, and that's really really important to be able to see super high quality current digital transfers of classic shit yeah absolutely and i mean i think that's you know that's why again you know just seeing mondo new york coming out on blu-ray was just so fantastic because this is so much important stuff and for it to be disappeared or to be just on these kind of really really rough bootlegs that you can barely you can barely even watch you know it's great to see to see it back i mean you know, you mentioned VHS earlier. I've got, <laughs> I've got so much stuff. I just reach behind me, and there's like, you know, stacks of tapes that I have to, yeah, I have to figure out how to transfer at some point. Right. <laughs> you know, oh, so you're talking about. So here's a funny story, Mondo story. So, um, one of the the um, one of the video stores in New York was called Kim's Videos, famous video store. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Right. And this, they have kind of a strange story. They took the entire library and they shipped it to Italy because there was a small town in Italy that wanted to start a VHS museum that sat there for years and years and years, never happened. And they brought it back. So um, what they've been doing is, and, you know, maybe 40,000 tapes, right? That every month they go and they pull a tape out, original VHS tape, and they screen it um, with an audience for free. And they pulled out Manda, New York. This is before I did the transfer. This is like maybe five months ago. And they play, they only want to play the original VHS tape, right? right. <laughs> so, and it's on a projector, right? So, you know, it's, fuck, it's out of sync. It's got color lines all over the place, right? It's like completely like as a filmmaker, you want to like pull your hair out, right? So after the screening, this woman comes up, young woman. By the way, there was no one in the audience that was over 35. So it's like, it was really right. wonderful. Young lady comes up to me. She goes, I really like all the colors. Did you shoot it like that to be that way? And I went, oh, God, forgive me, please. It's out of sync in the colors. It's an old VHS tape. So oh, I love it. It's so authentic. So weird that it's it's new and exciting. I know. I know. I just actually, um, I'm putting up for auction, you talk about VHS. I have, which I believe is the first VHS of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh. And still sealed. And um, there's a company called Heritage that has that auctions VHS. I wrote the guy, I said, hey, I got a, a sealed copy of this. And he's, what, I've never seen a sealed copy. And even the... It's from uh, it's it's I think it's the first release, and so I said I also have the first 
I have a beta sealed of uh, pink flamingos. Are you interested <laughs> in that one on beta? And I don't know if he wants that or not. But so I had a VHS company, um, which I started when I had International Harmony called Harmony Vision. And it was one of the first VHS uh, labels. And uh, it's really a, you know, you talk about film stories and, you know, Mondo stories. So like, you know, I'm a, got to think I was a film distributor in 1976 and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 78, a VHS distributor. What we used to do is there were probably five or six sub distributors around the country and you would give them a three quarter inch master to make the VHSs. But in order to avoid being ripped off, I used to go with a suitcase of box covers and sell box covers for $10 a piece to the distributors. Right. And I'd go around the country and take a trip, you know, a couple suitcases filled with, you know, hundreds of box covers. And that's how I distributed my, my VHS tapes. And at some point it was, you know, pretty, pretty, can you think about that now? Right. You know, Oh, go around and so oh, yeah i mean I, I kind of i kind of miss those days when when it was all renegade i mean you know the whole vhs thing over here was was wild um, in the beginning of the 80s you know i mean the thing that you have to know i know you got a couple of minutes left but the thing that's that that is sort of um important is the tactile communication between something material that has graphics on it yeah um, i'm 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 convinced that that vinyl is more than just putting the needle on and listening to the vinyl itself and oh yeah you know, I think it has a more dynamic uh approach it's you know there's nothing like opening up you know looking at it and you know of course there's nothing like sitting and listening to a side of an album which you kind of don't do on spotify Many thanks to Stuart for talking to me. Um, I think you'll agree that was a great interview. There's so much more to talk about, and we will definitely be looking into doing that at our later date, discussing more on his amazing career, more on VHS archiving and his adventures in film distribution. Again, Mondo New York is now available. Um, from MVD, a part of their Rewind collection. It's a really great addition. Comes with um, a nice booklet, fold um, out poster, and it's a double edition. So you can actually get the CD soundtrack and as well. So, really great, really well worth picking up. And before anybody asks, no, I don't have any affiliate connections to the links that I'm going to include on this video. So it's a genuine recommendation. I hope you've enjoyed this and we'll be back soon with more video, whether it'll be interviews, whether it'll be something else from our archives, who can say, but we'll see you soon.